We are very happy to have today at AI seminar at TI, Professor Amin Beheshti, uh, Director of Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence at uh, Macquarie University, which is in Sydney, Australia. And our today's talk is perfectly aligned with uh, the topic of our seminar. It's going to be about knowledge bases. I, I would assume that 4.0 means like a newest generation of knowledge bases. So, and uh, so basically it's about how you integrate big data, artificial intelligence into intelligent knowledge bases. So uh, Professor Amin, uh, please go ahead. The flow is yours. Well, thank you so much, Maxim. Uh, hi everyone. I hope you are all well and safe. Uh, special thanks to uh, Dr. Hakim for uh, organizing this uh, talk. And, you know, I really uh, would love to you know, have this in person, but unfortunately all, all the rooms, you know, they're booked in TII, but they're still lucky enough, you know, to be able to deliver this talk, you know, online and hopefully we can be in touch after that. Uh, so my name is Amin Beheshti. I'm a full professor of data science and director of uh, Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence. A brief overview of uh, the center. Uh, we are quite a big center, you know, over 50 uh, staff and postdocs. We have uh, 60 plus PhD students. Uh, in the last few years, we were able to secure over 21 million in research grants, specifically from uh, industry partners. So this number does not include uh, projects like CRC uh, or other you know, funding that we have, specifically uh, working with industry partners and getting them, you know, to fund our research projects. You know, we have big companies like Tata, banks like, for example, Westpac, Prospa, uh, the biggest real estate, you know, agencies in Australia like Domain, uh, Industry 4.0 companies like Fadem, uh, Truth is the leading company in uh, uh, safety and security, uh, same as Westpac. So lots of companies and, you know, the center focus specifically on applied approaches. You know, we help organizations understand their big data, use it in a smart way, and we come up with lots of interesting innovations at the same time. I also founded the Data Science Lab. Uh, so Data Science Lab specifically focus on attracting top research students. And, uh, you know, I believe that there shouldn't be uh, no PhD scholarships or research scholarships unless there's a company sponsoring you know, those projects. And we, you know, that was our aim at the start, you know, four years ago when we established, you know, this center uh, and the research lab, you know, we had uh, over 75 uh, industry-based scholarships, uh, 30 plus projects, uh, and all the students uh, recruited, you know, in the same company that sponsored the scholarships. We have, you know, 100 plus publications specifically in the field of uh, applied AI and lots of interesting projects, you know, from uh, Australian, federal police to banking, uh, education, uh, risk assessments, uh, linking cognitive science to data science and all those things. And the third entity that I established is the Big Data Society, a student society that uh, we engage students with industry partners. You know, we organized very big hackathons, workshops, seminars, and uh, contributed a lot in employability of our students. Uh, so more than 30% of the students you know, involved in, the, in these events uh, recruited by the companies uh, sponsoring those events. So high-tech companies like IBM, AWS, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, so today talk specifically, I want to highlight the importance of knowledge graphs and you know, how they can uh, be the backbone of you know, all these uh, technologies you know, that we hear around you know, generative AI and the new technologies. You know, in the back end, you know, we need to focus specifically on linking cognitive science, data science, and semantic approaches, you know, for automatic en enrichment of knowledge graphs. To be on the same page, you know, I just briefly, uh, you know, uh, quickly discuss, you know, some sort of backgrounds like application, you know, with, you know, application is a set of programs, program set of related function, function set of related statement. All of us know, you know, uh, what are the statements, including assignment, selection, iteration. The simplest one is the assignment when you assign a value to a variable. And we know this is a simple uh, data structure and the first step that we are dealing with data. So any applications, specifically data centric requires data structures as simple as a variable to more abstract and reusable data sets, uh, data structures like ADT, abstract data types. 
And then all these things, these structures you know, will be in the main memory. And then the statements that we discussed, you know, will access this data, you know, generate some sort of new information and knowledge. Then we uh, should be able to persist this information. Also, it's important to understand the applications from platform point of view. We have hardware, software, hardware, you know, different technologies uh, and backends, you know, for uh, devices like cell phones, uh, tablets, software, different operating systems. And a very important notion of platform independent application that has been uh, providing you know, all technologies and businesses you know, with new opportunities. <clears throat> uh, Platform independent application is an application that is able to uh, execute and deploy on any specific platform. So it doesn't matter if you have a cell phone with different operating system or a laptop or PC with different operating systems, uh, these applications you know, will be uh, accessible. A good example of them are web applications. So all the idea of web applications came from the notion of a file. Uh, we have two types of file in general, binary, and text. So binary files, you know, you know, you need to have a specific application to be able to, you know, create, create, read, update, delete new files. But text files, you know, they can be created, read, update, delete on any specific platform. So this idea came to Tim Berners-Lee's mind, who is the inventor of the web, and he started introducing a text-based standards for presenting the data like HTML for transferring the data from one system to another system like XML or for example, RDF, uh, different protocols uh, to make it, uh, you know, add, to make the dream of you know, having a platform uh, independent application. Uh, the notion of web service is very important. So now you see any function or program uh, that we are developing, you know, we intend to have them as web services. So simply consider a program that extracts keywords from text. Let's say you have a tweet, you want to extract keywords from the text of the tweet. You have an email, you want to extract keywords you know, from the text of the email. Then this program you know, extract a set of keywords, right? If this program is not connected you know, to any network, uh, you need to go to that specific computer and use the resources there like CPU and RAMs. But what if we are able to deploy this program as an API or web service? on web and any computer connected you know, to web can remotely execute the program. So of course, you know, there will be different protocols to send and receive uh, information. For example, if you want to send HTML files, you need HTTP protocol. If you want to send and receive XML files, you need simple object access protocol. So lots of interesting researchers in the same area. Uh, API engineering, microservices, service-oriented computing. So these are you know, very uh, still very hot uh, research Topics, just you know, as an example, consider you can have anything as a service. You have a database, you know, you can have it as a service. You have, for example, a data lake, you can have it as a service. Even a very complex, for example, programs, you know, you can just have them as a service. So to understand that it's very important to also highlight the uh, architecture of a specific applications. So, you know, the normal architecture, you know, that we teach students is three-tier architecture which means any program should have three layers or three tiers. Presentation, logic data. So presentation could be a command line, could be a graphical user interface. Logic, this is where you know, we deal with data structures and programs to generate new insight. And then data layer is where you know, we intend to persist the information for a long time. So for example, relational databases <laughs> or new type of databases that we call them NoSQL, not only SQL. So data, you know, we know we are generating huge amount of data every second on different islands, social, open, private, IoT, uh, and just, uh, you know, just to uh, have a very simple example, you know, uh, for Twitter, you know, each second, you know, we have over 6,000 tweets, you know, 12 terabytes of data every uh, day. Uh, even organizing, you know, this huge amount of information is challenging. Uh, so data is defined as information that has been uh, translated into a form that is efficient for storage and processing. So there are lots of techniques and technologies uh, for storage as well as for processing. But what has been missing in the mid middle is turning the raw data into contextualized data and knowledge. So one of you know, the main goals you know, of our research center is specifically focused on this specific task, you know, which, we call the, which we call data curation. 
the data curation you know facilitates automatic transformation of raw data into contextualized data and knowledge metadata is very important so we tend in tracing as much as we can so metadata is information about data is not a first class citizen but we trace as much as we can and then at some stage maybe if we find value in those uh, traced information we turn them into first class citizens so the approach called you know, cross-cutting aspects of data, including provenance, versioning, privacy, security. And you see any smart devices, you know, they trace information in different granularity. So for example, your cell phone, you know, trace information, what sort of uh, apps you are installing, you know, how frequently you are using them. Even at the level inside the app, for example, if it's a Spotify, you know, what sort of music you are listening to, how frequently, et cetera, et cetera. So the more we can trace information later, you know, we can provide lots of other interesting applications. Provenance is a very a good example of metadata, which uh, generate the story of a digital object back its derivation. So for example, here you see at the right side, we have version two of a document. And then if we are able to trace everything you know, that generated uh, this version from previous version, so who contributed to the file, how the content evolved over time, on which system you know, we have access to you know, this information, et cetera, et cetera. Then we are able to tell the stories back to the derivation and origin of the file. So provenance is one of the very hot topics still. And there has been lots of interesting work you know, leveraging blockchain technologies in the back end to be able to automatically you know, trace you know, all this information. Mm -hmm. So I will share the slides with you in each of the slides. You know, I, uh, cited the uh, reference in you know, some of uh, our previous work. So if you, if you are interested, you can learn more you know, about all these things and stuff. So let's go to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence you know, have been there for a long time, uh, but why today you know, we have this great opportunity uh, you know, to uh, you know, get benefit from artificial intelligence. You know, one of the main reason is the huge amount of data and information that we are generating. And all these you know, could be used as an input to the models and then uh, help us, for example, to automate processes, improve processes. In general, whenever we discuss about artificial intelligence, you know, this is uh, simply decision-making. So as humans, uh, so at each point in time, we have you know, more than one option. So for example, when you wake up in the morning, you can decide to make up your bed or not. So you see there are different options ahead, but you know, choosing the best next step would be where artificial intelligence could jump in and help us you know, in decision-making. There are three main components you know, in all the definitions you know, around artificial intelligence, uh, which includes data learning uh, components and tasks. So data you know, could be from uh, data to big data. I will discuss about a very simple motivating scenario to discuss uh, how big data is different from large data sets that we had before. Uh, then we have learning components. So when you have a raw data, then technologies you know, can help you make sense out of the data and more specifically understanding the data. So as data scientists, the main research problem that we are focusing on is under understanding the data and these learning components will help us to achieve that. If your data is image, then image processing techniques you know, can help you understand the image. If you are dealing with textual data, then natural language processing you know, can help you understanding the text. And at the same time, you know, there are lots of other technologies, including, for example, knowledge graphs and crowdsourcing techniques can heavily contribute you know, to this component. And then the most important part that can provide value for organizations, you know, is the processes, goals, and tasks. So this is where AI, you know, can help us in decision making. We had, you know, some sort of, you know, structured processes before, but today, you know, most of the processes are knowledge intensive and data centric. That's why, for example, uh, senior people in organizations, you know, they are really valuable assets because they developed, you know, lots of knowledge in their biological neural networks over time. And the notion of knowledge base 4.0 is specifically, you know, try to mimic that knowledge using you know, crowdsourcing services and then semantically annotate, you know, the knowledge bases or knowledge graphs you know, that we had before. So this way we can provide new opportunities for artificial intelligence to generate, you know, more accurate, for example, decisions and results and help us in decision-making. 
So let us quickly discuss what is big data. So big data is the data that generates you know, over different islands of data from social, open, IoT, private data. Each island of data could be quite large. So that's the main difference between large data sets and big data. So linking you know, these information, uh, understanding the relations you know, uh, among you know, the information items would be a key uh, to benefit from this huge amount of information. A simple example would be police investigation and some of the projects you know, that we had with Australian uh, federal police. So in simple police investigations, you know, police investigators interview people on the scene. Uh, so that's one island of data generating you know, lots of information. They are interested, interested to see and understand the data generated on social media. So lots of people you know, share images and posts. And many of them you know, could be used at, uh, as evidence and fact. Open data, for example, you know, the news agencies generate lots of information around the same events. IoT data, you know, we can use CCTVs to trace information. And there's a huge island of data, which is historical police data, previous cases, people of interest, et cetera, et cetera. So just consider, you know, a magic approach that can mimic all this information, organize them in a central database, which we call data lake, automatically contextualize them, which we call knowledge lake, and then add the experience of experienced uh, police investigators you know, to this information to provide a very good asset uh, to help investigators in decision making, finding fact and evidence in real time, and choosing the best next step. So that's very briefly you know, what we call as knowledge base 4.0. Four different types of AI systems. Analytical, so this could be as uh, simple as predicting the number of customers you know, in an organization. Let's say for in universities, it's very important to predict the number of students you know, joining the university in the next few years. It could be as small as a restaurant that, for example, you can help them with these analytical approaches to predict the number of customers you know, attending the restaurant in you know, different days of the week. Human inspired, you know, we have lots of techniques around cognitive assistance that can easily help in decision making and you know, this has been there you know, for a long time so a cognitive assistant that can facilitate collecting the information and then helping decision making generative ai so it's a very hot topic these days so we have heard lots of interesting stories you know, around uh, for example chat gpt as an example of a generative uh, ai model uh, and the opportunity that they provide uh, you know, would be you know, quite different you know, compared you know, to the previous stories around artificial intelligence. So they mainly focus on creativity part of AI. And then uh, I'm sure you know, many of you, you know, have tested chat, chat GPT. It can help you, you know, with uh, any tasks you know, that you have been thinking about. So for example, one of my PhD students when she finished her master last year in December, she just used ChatGPT to generate a two-page proposal out of you know a hundred-page uh, endless thesis, and it looks you know really amazing. So, for example, you can uh, get help from ChatGPT to uh, generate a CV for yourself, or focusing on some specific strength. You can give it a text and ask, you know, highlight, you know, these specific keywords, you know, based on the importance in the context. Or, for example, you can ask, you know, what are, what would be the new, you know, ideas, novel ideas, you know, around, you know, linking X to Y. And all, all the things, you know, that, you know, we have been observing as a result has the potential to provide uh, lots of new opportunities for organizations. Uh, so I tested you know, chat GPT trans uh, converting a very big Java project into a Python in less than one hour. So normally if I wanted to uh, allocate some money for an RA to do that, you know, it would be minimum a three month project. So lots of organizations you know, started uh, using chat GPT to generate code, to optimize codes, to convert you know, codes you know, from one language to another language. And it, it really looks you know, perfect. So, Looking at it you know, from a future point of view, the opportunities would be really huge. Uh, humanized AI. So if you go, for example, to factories like Tesla, you don't really see you know, people working there. 
and it's mainly robots, you know, doing things and stuff. Uh, so these four types of uh, AI systems, business processes are very important because this is where it provides values to organizations. Organizations only understand the value and revenue that you know, any specific approach can provide. And recent advances in generative AI shows that you know, it has the ability to transform how businesses operate. So a great opportunity of future works and uh, let's say, for example, generating new types of business process models, et cetera. But what is a business process? It's a set of tasks and activities uh, for achieving a specific goal. So for example, if you look at it you know, from the university point of view, we have processes to get a students enrolled in a unit, drop from a unit, or for example, uh, more ad hoc you know, processes, like for example, preparing for uh, exam, or you know, a, a, a interesting you know, a process would be the PhD process, a three-year project or process that has different phases. And in each phase, you generate, for example, huge amount of data and information. That's why we are living in an era that we are moving from structured processes into knowledge-intensive and data-centric processes. So these processes you know, include in lots of government and organization processes from budget analysis, health, education, immigration, policy investigation, e-safety. So these are some of the examples of the projects that we had in the center and we heavily contributed to uh, help these organizations understand their big data, use it in a smart way, in process automation, in improving their processes. And uh, I will discuss you know, about a few of these innovations in the next few slides. If you are also interested to learn more, we have a book titled Process Analytics, another book, Data Analytics, a recent book that we have, Social Data Analytics. So specifically, we started you know, from analytics on different types of data and processes. And now this is a very good time for us you know, to generate a new knowledge you know, around applied AI. So how we can use you know, these technologies to solve real world problems in an intelligent way. To address these, you know, three main innovations that we had started from Data Lake, then Knowledge Lake, and Knowledge Base 4.0. So dot, Data Lake, you know, we all know, Data Lake is a centralized repository that mainly focuses on organizing the big data because it supports you know, different backends from relational to NoSQL. Uh, so the contribution that we had in this field specifically was a Data Lake as a service. If you remember, you know, in the start of the seminar, I introduced you to web service, a program that deployed on the web, and anyone connected to web you know, can easily send and receive information uh, to use the program. Look at it from the right side of the figure. It's a person that wants to use the data lake, and then there are some, for example, services for creating, reading, updating, deleting, and querying the data in an easy way. You can tell the service, create, for example, this entity in relational database, let's say MySQL, or for example, in NoSQL, MongoDB. You have a tweet, you know, you decide, you know, you want to store it in MongoDB. You have an email, you want to store it, for example, in MySQL. Automatic indexing is there, a federated search on top. So a SQL-like query that can be used uh, to query any information in any island of data. So you know that NoSQL doesn't support SQL, but we leverage on different applications, including Apache Drill and Phonics to translate a SQL-like query into a form that is understandable for NoSQL databases. We have components for metadata, so everything will be traced in a form of a graph. So for example, we support tracing and provenance. So it's a different, for example, graph database in the back end that uh, tracing everything and also security is part of you know, any uh, programs. So this project you know, is available on GitHub and you know, published in top conferences like CIKM. Then next step, you know, we introduce Knowledge Lake and Knowledge Lake as a service. So we introduce Knowledge Lake as a contextualized data lake. The story is the same. If you, if you look, again, there's a service that enable you to store information uh, in data lake. So that's the raw data. Let's say, for example, you store the tweets, you know, as it is. You store an email as it is. But we introduced a set of services, curation services that automatically transform the raw data into contextualized data and knowledge. Let's say you have a tweet 
let's say, you know, this uh, yellow circle is tweets. The tweet has text. Then from the text of the tweet, we extract keywords, name entities, topics, sentiments. So ex extraction would be, you know, one of the steps in curation. Then enrichment. Let's say, for example, if you have a keyword, you know, you can find similar keyword. If you extracted a person like Barack Obama, then you can enrich it or you can link it, you know, to uh, external knowledge sources like Wikidata. Then you can tell, okay, these tweets, you know, contains you know, a person who was 44th president of the United States. So extraction, enrichment, and linking. And we have interesting, you know, publications in uh, published in WWW conference that specifically uh, introduced the uh, different granularities, you know, of uh, microservices that are able to extract different types of information. A simple example, you have one service for extracting name entities in general, so people, organization, etc. Then you can customize it to extract person. Then you can customize it to extract, for example, people who are related to topic politics. So you see, this is how, you know, the microservice uh, architecture could help you extract different information based on the needs of the analyst. But what is interesting here, you know, these curation services also include linking services. So when you contextualize, for example, the items like a tweet and then email, for example, is another item that you already contextualized. If both of these items, let's say, contain the same name entity of Barack Obama, then linking services you know, will compute the similarity between the objects, items, text, et cetera, and link this information together. So this knowledge graph will evolve over time and then generate a huge graph that mainly you know, is, uh, contains you know, all the knowledge that we require. But what is the missing point here? The missing point is that in you know, all these curation services, you know, they are uh, automatic based on extraction, enrichment, et cetera. We use reinforcement learning, for example, for improving the quality, but still the missing piece is to mimic the knowledge of uh, domain experts, subject matter experts, and then use that knowledge you know, to annotate this graph. So if we can do that, you know, that will be a huge opportunity and next generation of knowledge bases and knowledge graphs. So this is what we call knowledge base 4.0. So the exact thing that I mentioned, but a new component is there, uh, use um, uh, crowdsourcing systems to mimic the knowledge of subject matter experts. So if we start, uh, I hope you see the mouse you know, that I'm moving on the screen. So in the Bottom part, you know, we have the data lake that we discussed. So data lake is mainly for organizing the raw data. And then we automatically contextualize the data on top of that, you know, we have the knowledge lake. Then we have this component, you know, at the left side, which we call it, you know, rule-based crowdsourcing services, specifically sharing, you know, some micro tasks with uh, subject matter experts. And then based on the feeds, you know, we generate uh, some annotations, you know, for the contextualized data plus we generate you know, some new rules. So what are these rules? So let's go back you know, on top of the knowledge base 4.0. In general and the tradition, uh, traditional definition of a knowledge base is a set of concepts and instances of those concepts. So if you look at Wikidata, one concept is uh, people, person, and then one instance could be Barack Obama as an instance of this person. So there should be a rule like, for example, rule four to link the instance, you know, to the concept. So this is how the rules are working. Some of the rules, you know, find similarity between two instances. Let's say Barack Obama is similar, you know, to another politician, for example. They generate their rules. Each of the rules, you know, they have their own definitions and annotations. Uh, there has been a very interesting previous work, repair down rules, you know, we mainly used, you know, for defining different rules at different levels. <laughs> New rules, you know, can connect the instances to the contextualized items we have in the knowledge lake, or even connect them, you know, to the raw data. So you see, if you look at it, you know, from application point of view, always data analytics requires fact and evidence. So the more connections, you know, that we establish here, then later, you know, we can provide, you know, more evidence and fact, you know, for any, any type of application. 
And then here you see we have the knowledge graph, which specifically the nodes, you know, include the raw data, the contextualized data, the concepts, the instances, and the rules. So all these rules are the knowledge of subject matter experts that try to connect these information, or at some stage, they help us generate new nodes, or for example, uh, connecting a set of nodes, you know, for example, to define hyper nodes of type, for example, node and hyper nodes uh, folder and hyper nodes of type paths. So a folder node is a set of related nodes, a path node is a set of related, for example, relationships. And all these, you know, could be a simple query uh, in a form of a regular expression applied on this specific knowledge graph. And what is important here, okay, so we have a very good source of knowledge. Uh, which includes uh, everything that we generated from the data lake, the knowledge lake, and then the subject matter expert knowledge. But it is very important, you know, to be able to summarize this information based on the need of the domain experts. That's why, you know, another line of work that we defined in the center is a specifically focused on storytelling with data. And we have different data services focus on summarizing the data. So, uh, at the moment, I have 23 PhD students, you know, few of them specifically focus on uh, summarizing, you know, the graph and, you know, the big data. There are very interesting works that we are doing, you know, around the widget. So these widgets, you know, uh, uh, could be used uh, to visualize, you know, the data summaries and provide more insight. So all these uh, storytelling with data, you know, try to make sense out of, you know, this uh, large knowledge graph. And then there's a cognitive assistance on, on top. So it could be, let's say, an extension of chat GPT or you know, previous uh, you know, chatbots and conversational AI that we have uh, to provide suggestions to a knowledge worker. So this knowledge worker could be, let's say, a police investigator who just joined the police, could be a new, for example, lecturer who just joined the university, could be an analyst a new analyst, you know, without no experience that joined, for example, a bank for, uh, let's say, focusing on money laundry, for example, uh, analytics. And these people need help in choosing the best next step and doing processes. So this is a simple example of a knowledge intensive process. The chatbot or the cognitive assistant could be easily used to help a knowledge worker choose the best next step, best step in an easy way. And as you see, the cognitive assistants, you know, have access to huge amount of information, which is already summarized. We have one interesting work in uh, storytelling with data, which published in WWW conference and specifically a uh, visual interactive uh, dashboard uh, that can facilitate uh, identifying the important information from the graph based on the need of knowledge workers. So the name of the paper is I a story. Uh, so if uh, it is also cited, you know, in this paper uh, in knowledge base 4.0. So huge opportunity for lots of you know, different tasks and activities uh, from different levels. Uh, but you know, this is a very high level, you know, system view of knowledge base 4.0. And another challenge, you know, that we had, you know, was how to define the questionnaires and share them, you know, with the knowledge workers. Uh, mainly, you know, we use uh, we use crowdsourcing uh, techniques and you know some automated approaches to generate the micro task. But the main knowledge, you know, we interviewed you know lots of experts, for example, in policing, a person who has been working thirty years, for example, in the field. We have interesting projects in identifying you know creative creativity and creativity pattern or mining creative you know data from educational data. So we interviewed lots of experienced. Uh, lecturers and professors in university to be able to define those micro tasks. But after a while, you know, all those micro tasks you know, will be generated automatically and generate lots of interesting rules in the system. Of course, quality, you know, of these rules is you know, another aspect of the project. Uh, a simple motivating scenario in police investigation, uh, just you know, to put all these things and stuff together and, you know, help you better understand what's happening here. So the motivating scenario focus on missing persons. So we have different investigation uh, processes uh, in policing. One of them in, is missing person. So for example, in Australia, uh, we have 38,000 people reported missing each year. So why most of them, you know, uh, you know, will be found, you know, very quickly. You know, still there are lots of you know, mystery cases. Uh, 
And it's very important for the police officer to collect and analyze information in the first 24 hours. In US at each point in time, you know, we have over 100K active missing uh, cases. The goal of this project is to develop a cognitive assistant in the form of an app on a cell phone provided you know, for police investigators. Police investigators you know, can use this app to collect information from the scene. They can take photo, they can interview people, it will be recorded and then turned into text. You know, we extract keywords, uh, name entities, uh, part of a speech, uh, connect this information you know, to historical police data. It can connect, for example, to CCTV cameras, you know, ingest the information. Uh, and then all you know different sorts of data. As you see, there is a car you know in front of the place. Suspicious, you know they take a photo of the radio. All the history of the call you know goes back to the system. Uh, huge knowledge graph will be generated. Lots of techniques for summarizing will be used. And it is very interesting. You know the way we summarize each of these applications. You know uh, depends on the specific domain. So for example, in policing, you know we use different approaches for summarizing the data, you know, uh, compared to our projects with banking or education. Uh, why is that? Uh, because, you know, the goal of the analysts are quite different. And, you know, some of them are specifically looking for items, some of them looking for patterns, some of them looking, for example, for all the possible paths, for example, between different two nodes. Uh, and then that's why, you know, this summarization could be also personalized. And then a digital dashboard that uh, easily uh, provide uh, fact and evidence you know, to the police officer. You know, they can choose the fact and evidence of interest. And then there's a reinforcement la learning you know, algorithms behind the scene uh, tries to understand, you know, okay, in this scenario, in this specific case, what would be the most, for example, the reliable uh, facts and evidence. Then it will try to use that for more personalizing uh, and offering or recommending, for example, data summaries in similar applications. We introduced a pipeline. This pipeline, if you look at, you know, from the left side, uh, use uh, the cognitive assistant in the form of app to collect information. All this information will be stored in data lake, automatically contextualized, summarized, and then uh, we use the experience of uh, knowledge workers or domain uh, subject matter experts you know, to provide customized recommendations. So data like we discussed about, so any information that you know, we identify you know, goes back to a very specific uh, data lake that assigned to that specific uh, policy investigation case. Then uh, knowledge lake will automatically contextualize the data and knowledge that we identified in the data lake. We have lots of, lots of interesting work you know, around summarizing the data. One of the interesting one, uh, you know, that we, uh, you know, we published in 2016, but as still, you know, we are innovating on top of that is uh, OLAP for graphs. So, you know, OLAP is online analytical processing, mainly for relational uh, databases where we have the cubes, dimensions, uh, sales measures and operations, but, you know, we considered in this work, we consider the relationship among entities as first class citizens, and then use that to redefine you know, the cubes, dimensions, cells, et cetera. Uh, very interesting work in uh, personalizing the summarization activities. Uh, and you know, my understanding is that you know, this will be also a very good asset you know, for uh, the back end of knowledge graphs. Then the last step would be mimicking the knowledge of uh, domain experts. So whenever you know we are in a stage that the policy investigator you know, has a specific question, you know they can post their question, and then there are lots of microservices you know translate that question. Domain experts you know answer that, and then based on the answer we generate a new rule. So next times, for example, uh, there will be lots of you know more relevant evidence and facts, uh, and there is no need you know for a question. You know the app after a while. Uh, the cognitive assistant you know, will suggest, okay, now you need to do this. Now this is the best, for example, uh, next step. And these are some screenshots you know, of, the, of the apps developed. Uh, another interesting project you know, that I want to discuss with you is linking cognitive science and data science. Now this is uh, quite important. And I believe that you know, there are lots of uh, insight could be uh, connected from the cognitive science, you know, uh, very uh, 
project, most of the projects that we have, you know, requires understanding the personality, behavior, and attitude of the customers. For example, customer success, customer churn, so all these things and stuff, you know, could be used to provide value to data science. So this is interesting work that we have. We introduced personality to it, you know, as a simple embedding model that can facilitate identifying the personality, behavior, and attitude of the customers. So on top, we developed a domain-specific knowledge base, concepts and instances of the concepts, you know, in cognitive science and psychology. And then from the, in the bottom side, you know, we have the automatic contextualization of the social data, for example, or any type of data. And then there are some models, you know, in the in the between, try to link, you know, the contextualized items, you know, to the categories that we have in the knowledge base. And then you can easily uh, can monitor and analyze uh, the personality, behavior, and attitude, you know, of the customers over time. So you can easily predict customer churn, for example. Or for example, you can learn from the activities of a successful. Uh, you know, case as a customer. So one of my PhD students specifically extending this approach for customer to work. And the main goal is to uh, identify and segment uh, customers, you know, who have the same and similar patterns. So this will provide lots of value for the business. Uh, we use the same approach uh, in, in an education uh, project for uh, assessment to work. So that one you know, published in the very top uh, AI education conference. So the goal for that project is that you know, it's very time consuming for uh, teachers in universities you know, uh, to deal with marking assignments and final exams in large classrooms. Let's say you know, we have classrooms you know, with 3000 students in Macquarie University. So that our approach, uh, which is assessment to work, you know, the try to segment, you know, similar final exam questions. And then if you mark, you know, one of them, then uh, the model, you know, we we'll use the same approach to mark, you know, the rest of the uh, exams. And, you know, we have been testing that, you know, it is, it, you know, it, it, there's a huge, amazing opportunity in those approaches. Uh, another similar work from Berkeley uh, is, you know, they focus on a different approach uh, I forgot the name of the system, a grade scope. So if you search grade scope, so that's a similar project from Berkeley, but they don't use, for example, you know, segmentation. They specifically interact with the teacher, you know, to reduce the, the, the marking workload. Another interesting project is the project that we had with the government budget. Uh, so in Australia, in May each year, the government, you know, proposed the budget to the Senate. It's open to all Australians. You know, we can read and, you know, comment on different categories of budget, including health, for example. In top, you see different categories of budget, health, social welfare, defense, employment, education, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the goal of this project was to analyze social media to understand the social issues that citizens discuss about different categories of budget on social media, like Twitter. So what we did on top, you know, we developed a domain-specific knowledge base for each of these categories. Let's say for health, this knowledge base you know, has, a con has a set of concepts like people, organization, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, we use crawlers to identify different instances. So for example, Barack Obama is not related to people, organization, health, uh, Australia. But uh, GPs registered in Australia, for example, a specialist, uh, or Minister of Health, you know, those are the instances, you know, of this specific concept. That's why domain-specific knowledge bases, you know, there is a need to interview people in those fields, you know, properly understanding, you know, the concepts, identify the instances, then, you know, this will be a huge value. And you can turn this into knowledge base 4.0 in that specific domain. So we are doing the same, for example, for banking, and you know we are customizing, you know, such a domain-specific knowledge base specifically for banking, with the goal of uh, automating processes or improving processes in banking. And then from the bottom side, you see again it's an automatic contextualization, and there's a simple model, you know, try to connect, uh, let's say, this tweet, which is already contextualized, to these items, and it will tell you this tweet is related to Health Budget Australia 2016, for example. And then the next step, you know, would be much, much easier to, let's say, for example, analyze sentiment and all those things to, to see if 
the person here, you know, is highlighting something good or bad. And then there are some rule-based uh, approaches that we use to identify the social issues discussed. And the resulting you know, was really good and helpful for uh, analysts there. Another interesting work is the cognitive recommender system. So this is the, uh, the most top downloaded paper from uh, algorithm journal. So I also suggest you to have a look at that, specifically linking you know, data science and cognitive science you know, to have more uh, personalized uh, recommendation. So this is also a very interesting work. And around you know, 5 million of research, our research grants you know, specifically is based on uh, the idea here. Uh, we have uh, big projects with Tata Consultancy and different banks you know, trying to develop a knowledge base for banking. Specifically, the goal is to automate processes or improve processes, including fraud detection, customer segmentation, managing customer data, intelligent recommendation, et cetera, et cetera. So after this, you now I will share the slides with uh, Hakim. So you will also have access you know, to the uh, papers that I referenced uh, for each slide. Our recent uh, project with Domain, uh, Domain is the number one real estate uh, organization in Australia. Uh, we define the project as storytelling with data. So it has you know, different uh, sub projects, like for example, data generation. So mainly we are using generative AI in automating you know, the processes in uh, real estate. So this includes, for example, personalizing narratives to customers who are looking, for example, for buying a property. Let's say you have three kids, you have this culture, you, know, you have these needs, you know, these are the things that you want to do. And then the system you know, will tell you, okay, this is the suburb uh, you know, with these uh, schools, et cetera, et cetera, that you can buy the property. So based on the different factors, it can start, for example, uh, generating uh, information. Uh, another interesting project that we have here, and I have two PhD students who started working on that, is storytelling with image data. So, you know, when you have a set of image, you know, uh, fed into the system, it will generate narratives uh, based on natural language statements and tell you what's happening in one image or set of related images. So, you know, that could be a very interesting feed into AI algorithms as well. Okay, so I think uh, we are we have a few minutes uh, for Q and A. Again, you know, I want to thank all of you, especially Hacking, for organizing this talk. I'm really looking forward, you know, to have collaborations with you, uh, and I think it's a good uh, opportunity for Q and A. Uh, thank you very much, Amin, and dear colleagues, if you have questions, please. Uh, write them in the Q&A section and uh, we will pass them to Professor Amin. Uh, so I think, uh, well, I can start with, uh, with a question. So um, uh, probably a bit conceptual. So um, this ch recent chat GPT uh, had, uh, seems to have a significant impact. So, and uh, there are many, many, many opportunities, but in certain way, this approach seems to be uh, like in a contradiction with what you are doing, I would say, uh, because uh, you are advocating for very structured data, which is of course, uh, potentially very beneficial. However, to the best of my knowledge, ChatGPT mostly uh, processes just texts uh, without any more structure added. And uh, it's quite clear that this approach has uh, uh, certain deficiencies. Uh, I mean, uh, we all know that ChatGPT can make uh, false extremely false statements and so on. Do you see some opportunities for some integration between, between the two uh, so that uh, to make a more reliable systems or something like that? Yes, so very good question. I just want to highlight that, you know, we are not uh, looking at structured data. So you see the data curation approach that we have, uh, specifically, you know, you have a textual data, like for example, you know, the text in an email or the text, for example, in a tweet and then uh, you know uh, make more sense out of the text by extracting information and linking them so specifically you know the approach that we have you know for a knowledge uh, base you know could be 
the backbone, you know, to enable, you know, cognitive AI, uh, which depends on, you know, cognitive computing and semantic reasoning, you know, knowledge graphs, and specifically the knowledge base 4.0 that I discussed here, uh, is the connected data with semantically, you know, the enriched context. So specifically the knowledge that comes, you know, from domain experts, you know, highlight that, that thing. And it is the crucial step, you know, for the next move of AI, you know, no matter, you know, whether the AI rev revolution is in designing novel deep learning algorithms or solving, for example, you know, pressing real world problems. Uh, also, I remember, you know, uh, Gartner, you know, predicted that, you know, the knowledge graph application and, you know, graph mining will grow in 100% annually, you know, to enable more complex and uh, adaptive, you know, data science. And specifically, our approach, you know, could add value to the back end of generative AI, you know, if you, if you look at it, you know, from that specific point of view. So ChatGPT, as you mentioned, you know, is a large language model and specifically focused on text. But for example, our approach in storytelling with image data, you know, turn a huge amount of image into natural language text. And that could also, you know, provide lots of value for uh, prediction in the models as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, other questions, colleagues? Hakim, just, do you have questions? Yeah, yeah just one, one question, actually. I had a very similar question with chat GPT. I mean, we are all obsessed with this chat GPT, you know, so that's why we all have questions on that. But you were mentioning a lot of use of uh, reinforcement learning, I mean, in your work. Can you just give us a sort of a hint yeah, on yeah. How, how do you use it? So uh, as Maxim mentioned, you know, one of the challenges, you know, is the, uh, you know, false responses, you know, from, you know, all these models. So uh, simply reinforcement learning, you know, you can look at it, you know, from some sort of a feedback loop that you get samples, you know, from the result and share with real humans. And then, you know, you get the feedback of the humans, you know, to fixing the data. So you see after two months, chat GPT, you know, added, uh, you know, new, uh, two new buttons, you know, to the chat box. So uh, are you happy, you know, with the result or you are not happy with the result? So somehow, you know, getting the feedback of the users and that will be used for, uh, you know, refining the result as well. So if you are not happy, let's say, with the result. So again, in public systems, uh, you cannot really, you know, uh, uh, trust on the feedback. But for example, in the project, you know, that we had with uh, Politin, uh, so, you know, we shared those samples with domain experts who have been working, for example, 30 years in policy. So, you know, we trusted, you know, in their feedback and result. So that one you know, could be later used, for example, for refining, you know, the models. So how much uh, can we expect in terms of uh, fully automated and partially automated systems? I mean, so, so what's the rate of the automation we're expecting here? Uh, you know, I myself, you know, don't really believe, you know, on a, a, you know, automation approaches, but, you know, we can improve, improve a lot. So process improvement, you know, provide more opportunities rather than automation. Simple tasks, you know, could be automated, but, uh, you know, most of the processes, you know, that we have been observing working with industry partners, you know, mainly they are knowledge intensive. And automation really doesn't make sense. So we, in, in the at, at the moment with current technology, you know, we can provide some sort of suggestions, but leave the final decision, you know, to uh, the analyst and you know end users. Okay. All right. Thank so you. Technology intensive uh, processes are you know quite also interesting. And you know, how people make decisions, you know, how they use evidence and fact, and even you know with human, you know, we see lots of, for example, cases that after a while, you know, we come to the conclusion that, you know, those people, you know, did the wrong decision, for example, and it's normal. And that's part of the intelligence here. Very good. Thank you, Amin. It's a pleasure. Maxim, there is, there is Reda who is raising his hand. Yeah, I, yeah, that's good. I, if Reda can speak up, but I'm not sure that he can. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Reda, I, I, I think that you are not allowed in this type of webinar to speak, so you should ask the question by text via Q&A option, or probably, or probably, no, just Q&A. Yeah, please write there and we will pass the question to, to the speaker. It's interesting that you can raise a hand, but you can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> So I will be also available, you know, on email. So uh, you can share my email. I will share the slides with Hakim, 
and just feel free you know, to send me an email and uh, we can have discussions there as well. Okay, Rida just writes that he doesn't have actually a question, so probably his question was already answered. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, it seems uh, that we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much, I mean, for this very interesting talk. And uh, at least for me, it was a really different perspective because like myself, for example, I'm more on machine learning side, not that much on database side. So it's very interesting uh, to have this perspective and, and, and a bit more understanding. Thanks a lot for your talk and the hope to see you sometime, some other time, probably physically someday. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks a lot and bye-bye. Uh, Thanks everyone Thank for you very attending. Much, I mean. Thank you. Thank you, Akin. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.